to you. It's all yours. All right. Thank you, Trudy. Well, Trudy's uh, welcomed everybody aboard. So let me give my uh, thanks and good afternoon and welcome to everyone to today's Tuesday Explorers, a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by AARP Virginia. I'm Suga Sadi, an ARP Volunteer Community Ambassador with AARP Virginia uh, here in Northern Virginia. AARP is here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We will have time for Q&A at the end of Jim's presentation so please submit your comments and questions in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. I do, I do wanna thank my co-host and helper today, Trudy Murata. Like me, Trudy is a volunteer community ambassador with AARP Virginia. Her and I will be both monitoring the Q&A box and will facilitate the Q&A portion of our program depending on how many questions we have. We expect the program to last for an hour. Today on Tuesday Explorers, we explore the length people will go to for beauty, plastic surgery, chemical peels, and tattooed makeups are all extreme measures to achieve that picture perfect look. But at least we've got our doctor's seal of approval on their safety status. Beauty addicts from years gone by were not so lucky. From skin regimens brimming with poisons, and parasite-based diets to breathtakingly tight corsets and the hottest air styles, join us as we journey through some of the deadliest trends that claim their very fashion vic victims. This program is presented by Jim Lewis, our good friend. Jim Lewis is a noted Civil War and World War II historian, lecturer, and tour guide, and a longtime friend, as I've said, of Tuesday Explorers program. He has authored numerous historical markers and been the keynote speaker for their dedications. In recognition of his many local historical contributions, he was once designated Lord Fairfax by the Hunter Mill District. So if you're a history lover like me or for just having fun, you're in for a real treat. So please give a warm vir virtual welcome to Jim and Jim, the screen is yours. Thank you, Suba. Really appreciate it. It's always good to be with the uh, AARP group. Always some good questions and uh, great attendance, quite frankly. So, you know, it's pretty inspiring for a presenter. But anyway, um, today I'm going to be straying, as Suba mentioned, a little bit away from my uh, roots, uh, where I normally do some military and or espionage oriented type stuff. Uh, this presentation I put together in honor of a good friend and longtime lecturer. His name is Jim Dumphy, and anybody associated with Ollie, Osher Lifelong Living in the Fairfax County area, probably knew of him and or attended some of his uh, presentations. He passed away a couple of years ago, and at that time, I was a real fan of his, and we were good buddies, and I just decided, you know, He's deserving of another eclectic presentation, which he was the king of, and he would have loved this material, in my opinion. So I hope you all will, too. Anyway, is everyone ready? Well, let's do it. The links we will go to for beauty knows no bounds, as Suba had mentioned. Plastic surgery, chemical peels, and uh, tattooed makeup are all extreme measures to achieve that picture book. Uh, perfect look. But at least we've got, again, the doctor's seal of approval on most of the stuff that we're using today. There are still issues, believe it or not. You'll hear a little bit about that at the very end. But, you know, it, it's got the approval. So beauty addicts for years, uh, from years gone by, weren't so lucky. Uh, there were some real issues over time, as you might expect, throughout the ages with some of this stuff. This presentation will highlight some of the 13 deadliest trends that claim their own very own fashion victims. So as we go out throughout this presentation, just think as we go through it, okay, what other trends in history 
uh, you think Jim might mention here today. Again, 13 of them. Okay, let's start. By the way, this illustration was put together in 1862, and it was um, put together criticizing green dresses, which you don't see here, but you will later, and artificial plant wreaths made with toxic arsenic. So, of course, we have to start with our first trend, the friendly corset. They already had a bad reputation in the 1800s with doctors frowning upon them and a plethora of literature condemning the undergarment to achieve the hourglass figure. So popular at the time, women's corsets would be laced as tightly as possible with a recommended 18 inch waist. And there's a typical corset at the time. Now here's a beautiful lady obviously has a corset on. Uh, for those of you, and this is unbelievable. When I came across this, I couldn't believe this when I was doing my research. This is a iron corset from the late 16th century. And over here on the right is a corset featuring silk plain weave with a supplementary weft float patterning uh, and stiffened with whalebone which was very prominent in a lot of the uh, corsets at the time during the 1730s and 1740s. Ladies wearing their corsets often experience headaches, breathing tr problems, and fainting. No idea why. Now, you're going to see throughout this presentation, I took diagrams or illustrations at the time of uh, cartoonists, if you will, making fun of these fashions throughout history. This particular one depicts a lady having fainted while dancing because she basically couldn't breathe. Okay, these corsets were not just for women. Men also wore them, some for back support, but primarily for aesthetic purposes. They also wanted to accentuate that V shape from shoulders to waist to feature their strong health and attractiveness, much like the hourglass figure women desired. It also turned out to be a good foundation piece for formal wear, former wear, i.e. tuxedos. And here's an ad in the late 19th century showing um, a corset for the men. And here's some men's wear. This is 1850 through 1859. So again, illustrations of the day. Now, minor problem, besides not being able to breathe, uh, there were some issues, particularly early on. Uh, if you take a look at this, there are widespread reports of broken ribs, no clue why. Now this is normal over here. And this is the effect of the corset and what it had on the inside of an individual. So it's a depiction, uh, and this is from a 19th century textbook. Um, in the early 20th century, this is called the S-Ben corset, also known as the Edwardian corset. And that came into vogue again in the early 19th, 20th century. And here's an il illustration contrasting the old style corset with the S shape right here, silhouette. Featured, it featured a rigid straight busk inserted in the center front of the corset, which forced the torso forward and made the hips jut out in the back. It was intended to be less injurious than the other corsets by exerting less pressure on the stomach area. However, any benefits were more than counterbalanced by injury caused to the back due to the unnatural posture. The bust was also lowered and corsets provided much less support for the breast. By 1908, corsets began to fall from flavor as the silhouette changed to a higher waistline and more naturalistic form. Early forms of brassieres were introduced and the girdle which was more concerned with reducing the hips rather than the waist, soon took the place of the corset. 
Now, I'm just ex gonna extend that just a little bit for you. I don't know if you're familiar with this. You have to be, I guess, of a certain age to have ever heard of this. But in the late 19th century, Englishman, Dr. George A. Scott, there we go, Dr. Scott, who was a prolific advertiser of electric devices and other quack products in America. He took advantage of the confusion at the time by the general public over magnetism versus electricity. And he billed the following products advertised as truly electric and claimed that they were the key to treating all sorts of ailments, including constipation, malaria, uh, rheumatism, blood diseases, paralysis, and hair loss. I mean, this is the cure, folks, right here. Now, in reality, the manufacturer of this stuff was a company called the Paul Mall Electric Association, and they really use magnetic rods. And this particular advertisement right here actually admits that the association of these corsets was with magnetics, but they also continue to shamely reference their products as electric and incented others to do so for monetary gains. And this was very popular for many years. By the 20th century, advertising by Dr. Scott's products disappeared and presumably he went out of business. Okay, trend number two. For centuries, pale skin was deemed the height of fashion. Tan freckled faces were considered improper and a sign of being a peasant. Both women and women, men would go to extreme lengths to keep their faces as white as possible using paste, powders, and potions. Now, on the left-hand side, we've got Marie Antoinette and her ghostly pale complexion, which was at the time the beauty standard. The key ingredient in many of these lotions was lead. Using lead-based makeup led to baldness and inflamed skin. Then a vicious cycle would begin, where disguising skin defects meant using even more lead makeup. Now here's the inset of the whitest of them all. This is Queen Elizabeth I, and she was the most prominent at the time uh, utilizing this type of makeup. She began using lead makeup to hide her smallpox scars, prompting a trend that likely led to her death and those of many of her subjects. Lead poisoning, by the way, destroys the nervous system, causing paralysis and brain damage. Lead palsy is characterized by localized paralysis of the hands and dropped wrist. Here you go. These are wrist drops, also known back in the day as the dangles. And I'm sure you could connect those dots as to why. By the way, this was an occupational hazard with printers of the day, printing inks and that type of thing, which contained lead. Finally, if you think of the days of lead in makeup uh, have passed, think again. A recent discovery found that hundreds of lipsticks around the world still contain lead, but the amounts are perceived so low that they shouldn't affect you. Countless shade variations still abound, as we all know. Okay, a third trend, crinolines, crinoline skirts. By the mid 19th century, the epitome of elegance for women was to dramatically distort their natural body shape by wearing a crinoline shirt, uh, skirt. And this is a hoop body pe petticoat that was as large as reasonably and I do quote that reasonably possible. Skirts almost two meters wide. Now that's six and a half feet, uh, feet wide or 18 feet in circumference were the height of fashion. Over here on the left is Princess Dagmar of Denmark wearing a crinoline in the 1860s. Again, that's the American Civil War was just about ready to be fought at that time. 
Steel cage crinolines were some of the most popular. And they also, uh, a number of them contain whale bone, as I mentioned that before. Whales were under duress <laughs> throughout these ages for a number of reasons, beside the oils and everything. The Douglas and Sherwood's hoop skirt factory in New York was one of the biggest producers. They employed 800 women and produced 8,000 plus hoop skirts per day. And to do that, they required a ton of steel per day to crank these things out. Now on the right is a steel hoop cage crinoline underskirt. And this was made in eight, or this photo was taken in 1856, made from cotton braid cover steel, cotton twill and plain weave double cloth tape, cane and metal. Okay. Perhaps the most common problem caused by the hoop skirt was the sheer amount of space it took up. At social events, they were horribly impractical. One contemporary criticized them by claiming that one woman in her skirt took up the place of three men. Check out some of the jokes. And these are all jokes back in the day referring to this crinoline skirt. Here's a lady putting her crinoline skirt on. And here's the undergarment and here's the skirt that you can see. They've got sticks holding this thing up, <laughs> this skirt up, which will eventually be placed over her. This particular illustration uh, depicts what a man or a gentleman had to do to escort a lady down the stairs. You'll notice he's on the outside of the balcony going downstairs. So, the amount of space a damsel required at a formal affair was noted right here. You can see everybody else quite a ways away from the actual damsel, if you will. Sadly, this wasn't the only extent of the dangers of the crinoline skirt. Additional issues. Unlike the farthingales, which was the upper class uh, uh, dress, crinoline uh, by way of Spain, and the panniers, which you see right here, those are called panniers, and they're horizontally super hooped, so they're real wide, uh, horizontally, if you will. The crinoline was worn by Victorian women of every social class across the Western world, from royalty to factory workers. Textile firms instructed female employees to leave their hoops and crinolines at home as several deaths occurred when crinolines were dragged into the machinery. Unsuspecting aficionados were blown to their deaths in strong windy conditions while also at the same time being run over under the carriage wheels. Worst of all, these skirts were highly flammable, resulting in many fires by death. Unaware of their proximity to a candle, and this is a perfect example of it, here's a fireplace, uh, resulted in many deaths by fire. So she just didn't know she was admiring herself in the mirror, obviously, and just got a tad bit too close to that, that, uh, that fireplace. In 1863, here we go. This is back during the Civil War time, right in the middle of the war, quite frankly, in America. Up to 3,000 people died in a Chilean church fire that was blamed in part on the flammability of the skirts because they blocked the exits. In 1864, a year later, it was reported that in the previous 14 years, at least 39,000 927 women had died worldwide in crinoline-related fires. Although flame retardant fabrics were available, they were thought to be unattractive and therefore unpopular. So guess who wore what? Okay, number four. And this comes in three groups. Flammable hairstyles. The first group we're gonna do is the powering updo. I think you can uh, figure out why. <laughs> this is incredible. The late 18th century, the trend for tall tresses took off with women using hair cushions and false hair. 
human, horses, or goat. It all went into it, uh, depending upon your preference. And they reached dizzying heights, a number of which included theatrical touches, such as miniature sailing, ships, and flags. Here's a, a ship, obviously. And these are 18th century hairstyles, as I mentioned. Forgetful of the towering uh, tender atop of their heads, many ladies would be set afire by chandeliers and candles. A London paper even reported that a woman's wig and headdress being struck by lightning uh, because of the height of the hairpins, which supposedly set her hair on fire. Now, who knows if that's true, but you get the gist of this one. Okay, this is the second group of flammable hairstyles, and that is uh, combustible combs. Uh, in the early 1900s, celluloid was all the rage, replacing genuine expensive ivory and tortoise shell in various accessories such as hair combs. It was referred to as, quote, French ivory, unquote, to give it a little more snob appeal and even marketed it as such. And there are some of the accessories right up here on the left. The problem, little minor problem, it was flammable, extremely flammable, that just the mere proximity to a heat source, even storage in an attic or a sunny window could cause a comb to burst into flames or even explode. It caused a number of factory fires and occasionally burst into flames on women's heads and in the hands of children. Here are some of the hair, uh, uh, hair accessories right here. And if the fire didn't consume you, release of the toxic, toxic fumes would. By 1940, because of its detrimental characteristics, cellular combs and other assorted accessories weren't used very much. But I think you'll get a grin out of this. Here's a confirmation. This is another, you know, uh, display or a comment of the times about these celluloid accessories. And you could read what's written right here. This one's one of my favorites. This is a new, it was in a newspaper, and it's about an aged man commenting about an aged citizen losing his life while, quote, combing his long gray beard. Obviously, something happened with that brush. Okay, here's the third group. Hairspray whore. Come on, everybody knows the deal with this. We've seen it. We've Everybody has had the aer aerosol sprays and everything. But this was a hairspray in the 1950s. And it kept curls fixed in place and tresses perfectly coiffed as they were the height of fashion and hairstyle choice for many. And here we go, maintaining the hair. Uh, the only problem was before 1970, this stuff was contained vinyl chloride. It was a known carcinogen and it was linked to angiosarcoma of the liver in humans. Even more troubling was that the manufacturers were aware of its toxic effects for nearly a decade before removing it from the market. Now, it was then replaced with methylene chloride, which was later recalled due to similar carcinogenic effects. Now, by 1970, there was a widespread campaign against aerosol CFCs, and that's a chlorofluoro, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, it was extremely harmful to the atmosphere, contributing to holes in the ozone layer. I think we all remember that. And this led to an official ban in the United States. Now, there was an exception, and that was for certain medical applications, such as asthma inhalers. In 2008, all use of CFCs were finally banned. Today, hairspray is still used and considered a hair essential. Although CFC free aerosols are gone, they still emit VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds, which still do affect the ozone and environment, but certainly not as badly as the previous versions. Finally, propellants and aerosol cans are highly flammable. 
if there's a guy out there, you had to have done this at some point. I mean, we all do this. And when in contact with fire, it could also cause explosions. Empty aerosol cans are now considered hazardous waste in the United States. So that gives you a feel for where that went. Okay, let's continue on. This is trend number five. Wonder how many of you all remember this or have heard of it. Radium was discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie. Sounds very scientific, doesn't it? That's C-U-R-I-E and generated a great deal of scientific interest, even winning them the Nobel Prize in physics. Before long, medical and other commercial uses were found for this radioactive material. And before long, women began to smother their face in radioactive cream in their quest for a face with a youthful glow, even in the dark. And here's what was the most prominent back in the day, radioactive cream, though radio. And uh, here's, notice it's, uh, it's associated not with uh, Marie or Pierre, Pierre, but with Dr. Alfred Curie. Who was he? He was just a regular doctor. And he was put on there to give it credibility. Now he stopped his association with a company the moment the regulations surrounding the commercial use of radium change. However, many women continue to apply their radioactive makeup on a daily basis. Not surprisingly, radiation poisoning and cancer figures soared. Here they are, peddling this stuff at a trade show, faux radio. So it was very prominent back in the day. Now, there were a couple of uh, application techniques that were popular. One was mud. Here are the ladies here, and I'm going to mention this in a, just a little, uh, minute. This happens to be uh, some uh, radioactive cream that was applied. And I'll, again, uh, I'll mention uh, this a little bit more detail in just a second. So this was called Undark believe it or not, by the way, which gave one a glow-in-the-dark appeal. This is back in 1944. Matter of fact, D-Day was occurring in 1944, World War II. And here's an ad for the mud. And you could read, radium is a great benefit to humanity. Not just you, but humanity. And rich in radioactivity, which at the time was bragging rights, I guess. So on the right-hand side, there was a product called Undark, and this was a luminescent, luminescent paint. And this was applied to one's body throughout as much as uh, somebody wanted to paint themselves with. There were, uh, this concoction, by the way, Undark, also combined radium with zinc sulfide. Not the best combination. There were no safety precautions whatsoever. Scores of girls as young as 11 and young women painted themselves and all were referred to as, quote, radium girls. Sadly, they typically died a terrible and painful death. Now, I'm going to tell you a real quick story, and it's alluded to on this slide. When Amelia Magia died in 1927, the cause of death was listed as syphilis, but her friends and family wanted everyone to know that she had not died from that, and they felt that she had died from radi radium poisoning. Hence, they were able to convince the court to exhume her body, and upon opening the body, they found that her remains were still faintly glowing. And here's that slide of her, that x-ray that they took. So even in death, the radium girls continued to glow. And again, here's the x-ray. So, okay, mercury hats. Women weren't the only fashion victims in history. Late 1800s, hat makers, they were also called hatters, used a toxic subject, substance, mercury nitrate, as part of the process for turning fur of small animals, typically beaver, into felt for hats. 
And here we go. You can see the hat right here. Over time, the hatters start exhibiting apparent changes in their personality and worse, erratic behavior of hatters resulted in the term being coined, mad as a hatter. So that's where it came from. Mercury, mercury is a neurotoxin and attacks the nervous system. Basically, here's the net of it. You can't walk, you can't talk, you can't think. Symptoms, drooling, hair loss, teeth coming loose, uncontrollable muscle twitching, stumbling about with an uncoordinated lurching gait, and a confused state with slurred speech and trembling hands. Hence, hatters were sometimes mistaken for drunks. And here is a mad hatter. Here's a real deal. I mean, this guy's really out far, particularly back in the day, but here's a mad hatter. What these, some of these guys look like. In Dansbury, uh, Danbury, Connecticut, where hat making was a major industry, the ailment became known as the Danbury Shakes. By World War II, use of mercury in hat making was banned, not for health reasons, but because the mercury was needed for detonators. So, so disturbing was the Mad Hatter that he was popularized in comic books. And here he is in the debut of Batman, comic book number 49 in 1948. Later on, as a villainous character on the TV series, Batman. So listen, off to the side, I had a buddy uh, at one of my last presentations on this who I knew was very involved in the Civil War and thought I'd give him a little tip and he loved it. There's a fellow named Boston Corbett, Sergeant Boston Corbett. He's the guy that shot and killed John Wilkes Booth, Wilkes Booth, obviously who killed Lincoln. He was a sick pup. He attempted a suicide mission three times to kill Booth. And he was also uh, well known for being just way out there. And eventually he ended up personally circumcising himself or castrating himself. And um, I informed my buddy, I said, listen, he came from Boston and he was known as a mad hatter. And uh, my buddy said, oh my God, that explains why he was so wacko. I said, that's the way it is. So anyway, for those that are Civil War buffs, uh, it even affected uh, the Civil War, quite frankly. Okay, number seven, Adropa Belladonna, also known as Belladonna known as beautiful women in Italian. However, its English name, Deadly Nightshade, is more accurate. Deceptively named lethal poison as it's both sickly, uh, sickly sweet and toxic to the touch. In the Middle Ages, the women used it for cosmetic purposes and it created a reddish brown color on the skin, which made it effective if dangerous form of rouge. The problem was, its activation age ingredient was alkaloid atrophin, which is a powerful killer. Its roots had the highest concentration of the toxic alkaloids, but every part of the plant was poisonous to various degrees. Too strong a mix could lead to heart disease, mental illness, and or spontaneous abortion. Prolonged use caused visual disturbances, uh, inability to focus the eyes, increase heart rate, and eventually blindness with enough use. A single leaf or only a couple of these pretty berries could be lethal if ingested. And here's a, a tink, uh, um, apothecary a bottle carrying it. And this you could carry on your body should you uh, want it as desired. Okay. Now, I would assume a, a few of you all could remember these ladies right here, but first let's go left. It was especially prized for concocting eye drops that dilated the pupils, giving a user a classic sexy doe-eyed look, which was apparently a super hot look in Italy at the time. And there you go. Now, I don't know if you can guess who this is, 
But these ladies right here are 1940, 1950 starlets in America. This is Arlene Dahl. This is her before picture and after she took a little belladonna right here. You can see how the eyes are just so different. This lady here is Phyllis Kirk. And here's the before and after. Ironically, a more refined version is still used today to dilate pupils during eye exams and as a popular homeopathic remedy for asthma and arthritis. So <laughs> when you go to your uh, retinas, like I have to periodically, uh, you just got to think about that a little bit. And hopefully they got the, uh, the dosage right. Okay, this is one that blows my mind. I can't believe this particular trend. And the more I researched it, the more I couldn't believe it. This is called foot binding. And this was popular during the Sung, S-U-N-D, dynasty, 10th through the 13th century. As women with dainty feet were considered beautiful, even erotic. And this practice continued up to the early 20th century, primarily in China. It was also intended to attract suitors and flaunt one's upper crust. At its height, the contorted tradition was practiced by approximately 50% of the middle class in Chinese families and nearly 100% of the affluent families. All told, it is estimated that four and a half billion, billion Chinese girls were subjected to this practice. The process began early at uh, ages of four to five years of age, while their feet were still supple and their minds were just blissfully unaware of what was going to happen to them. Sparing you the gory details, and I could go through this in detail, it's, that's what blows me away. The process included the breaking of every toe, uh, except the big ones plus the arches uh, into a coveted four inch long crescent shaped moon shape, okay? And that's a shoe, which you're gonna see right down here. This is the target. That was, that's what you're gonna end up with right there. Here's a young girl uh, going through the process. And this is uh, wrapped around the foot. You can see how the toes are right here. There are, I mean, these are the toes right here wrapped under her foot. And um, this is a shortened foot. And it, uh, it, this is what they call a lotus shoe over there. And um, why was a lotus? You know, uh, over in Asia, a lot of these flowers and everything, you know, kamikaze and all that, they had to have the cherries blossoms and everything, but the lotus flower symbolized spiritual enlightenment and rebirth. And here's what the foot looked like inside of a transparent lotus shoe right here. Okay, now stiff color, collars. Number nine, what we now, what we know as a collar today started out for both men and women as a large ruff around the neck. Here's Queen Elizabeth I, and she was a fashion trendsetter. The logic, believe it or not, I, boy, I could use this, and that is to protect the edges of your clothing from wear and food. <laughs> I mean, how many of us drop food periodically on our shirts or whatever? Well, this prohibited it, but there were a few other issues associated with it. So it was more economical to replace a ruff back in the day than an entire dress or shirt. So people started competing with each other to have the most extreme version of this ruff. Here's a minor, and you can see where this stuff is going. Out of control, obviously. They eventually got so large that they could be up to a foot and a half across and seriously hindered the wearer's movement. As the rough died out, it was replaced by a high, stiff collar, and they got higher and stiffer over time. By the 1800s, they were very popular. However, they posed a physical danger 
Guess what could happen? Well, the obvious. Attached to a shirt with studs right here. Under normal sober, sober, sober conditions, the collar could be quite constrictive, but otherwise harmless. However, if a man had a few drinks for dinner and the stiff, the stiff collar could claim its victim, as a man sat in his armchair and his head dropped to his chest, the collar could block the windpipe and stop blood flow to the head. As he slept, he'd be suffocated by his own collar. These days, anyone with an upturned collar looks out of touch. However, polo shirts were actually designed to be worn this way. In 1929, Rene Lacoste created the tennis shirt and it had an upturned collar to prevent sunburn. So there was a reason for it. It was only when people started wearing polo shirts on a regular basis that they started laying their collars flat. Okay. <laughs> now this comes in a close second with the, uh, with the feet binding program in my estimation. Number 10. From the 1830s to the 1900s, and believe it or not, even recently, the tapeworm diet started with women in the Victorian era who wanted to achieve what society viewed as beautiful and hoping to attract a husband. The idea was simple, yet gross. One would take a pill containing a tapeworm. Here we go, right there. That's an advertisement or an illustration, if you will, once hatched, the parasite would grow inside the host up to 30 feet long, ingesting part of what the host ate. In theory, <laughs> theory, I'll say, this enabled the dieter to simultaneously lose weight and, um, uh, and eat without worry about collar uh calorie intake so this is uh eat 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 you can see this ad this is an advertisement and eat 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 with no ill effects whatsoever is what they advertise however just getting to the desired weight one faced a number of terrible side effects including one cyst in the brain two spinal cord and knives Three, as well as meningitis and epilepsy, minor side effects. If one were able to actually achieve their desired weight, here comes probably the worst part. Extraction of the tapeworm was not for the meek. Now, extraction ranged from pills to special techniques or devices. Now, I'm going to give you a couple. One attempted to lure the worm out by inserting, inserting a cylinder with food into the digestive tract. The problem was that many patients choked to death before the tapeworm was removed. Number two, the second one, another prescribed holding a glass of milk at the end of either orifice and waiting patiently for the parasite to come out. And this assumed that there was a preference by this parasite for the bovine lactose. Now, I said it's still kind of in existence today. I'm giving you an example. 2015, TV reality star, Khloe Kardashian. We've got to have the Kardashians in this somewhere. Uh, she suggested that she wanted to get a tapeworm on, quote, keeping up with the Kardashians. Well-known show. This evoked an article from Vice, V-I-C-E, regarding the legitimacy and dangers of diet. Claiming concern for public health, the FDA has officially banned tapeworm pills. So, it's the end of that. Number 11, the silent killer in the 1800s was the arsenic infused dress, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with this one. Let's drop back a little bit. 1775, advancements in chemistry enabled the creation of Schlie's green dye, also known as Schloch green. 
1814, a new and improved version was invented and widely known as, quote, Paris green or emerald green. Now, I remember growing up and we used to love to use emerald green ink. We thought it was pretty and all of that, but I had no clue there was any association with something like this. This new shade, emerald green, Paris green, turned the most bland dresses into a vibrant and enduring green um, and was all the rage in the Victorian era of fashion. Now, over here on the right, this is an afternoon dress. And this, again, Civil War time frame, 1865, dyed with arsenic green. This inset right here is a young Queen Victoria. Herself chose to wear emerald green fashion. So there you go. There's some leadership there, and people want to emulate her. Arsenic just happened to be, as many of us are now aware, it was odorless, tasteless but deadly and in almost everything. Painters, for example, would get sick from ingesting arsenic paint on their brushes. How? By using their lips to get a sharp point on a paintbrush. Arsenic lace paints and wallpapers were also popular because arsenic's insect insecticidal uh, qualities, which were also used to kill rats in Parisian sewers, um, were uh, prominent in the uh, dresses and wallpapers and paints and everything. Treating your walls prevented ants, termites, and other pests from eating out of the house and home. Unfortunately, it could poison more than just insects and rodents. Children who ate sweets color colored with the dye were reported to have died. Fashionable ball gowns contain as much as one half of their weight in arsenic. The British Amer Medical Journal said, quote, a woman in a green ball gown could, quote, slay the whole of the admirers she may meet within one half dozen ballrooms. Okay, here are the effects. Do I need to expand on this? You could take a look at it nasty rashes, wart-like growths, whatever. The workers who created the garments, primarily seamstresses down here, inhaled the dye and suffered the most from the effects of arsenic poisoning. Starting with headaches, they soon experienced cramps, convulsions, visual impairment, which could involve, evolve into a coma and then death. Worst of all, arsenic could be found in many other dyes too. So it's not just anything green, but basically any plain dress could become a dress to die for. Again, here are the effects and everything. Here's that arsenic waltz that was on my uh, cover slide. And I told you we'd eventually get to it in green. And here it is. And this is called also known as the dance of death, appropriately shaded in green. By the 1870s, its green reputation caught up with itself, prompting new dyes to be manufactured, supposedly without arsenic. Now, you'll love this. Arsenic was also known as, quote, the inheritance powder at, of the day, because people would often use it to kill, i.e. poison, family members to gain the inheritance. Okay. Powdered wigs, number 12, mid 17th to the 18th century, marked the heyday of powdered wigs for both men and women. Men followed the trend of two kings who began to lose their hair, and here they are. This is King Louis the 14th, and this is King Charles the second. They were cousins. This guy here, uh, King Louis, started to lose his hair at 17, and he hired up to 48 wig makers to take care of his problem. Uh, and this fellow right here, uh, King Charles II, he prematurely went gray. And he also had head sores from what was well known uh, at the time of syphilis, which a lot of people had back in the day. Courtiers started wearing wigs and the trend trickled down to merchant class 
men often opted for the full wig peruke, which is right here. Now look at this guy. He's, he's as bald as a billiard ball, but it's obvious here's the wig on top of him. And we've seen a lot of this over the years in movies and that type of thing. And what it did, it supposedly gave the illusion of status, wealth, and knowledge. And this fellow here, this is called affectionately the big wig. It was coined to describe snobs who could afford big poofy perukes. More elaborate wigs cost at the time $10,000 in today's currency. Women use partial wigs with natural hair to create excessive ornate styles. They were so expensive, the women kept them around for weeks on end just to justify their expense. So why were wigs made out of horse, goat, or human hair powdered? Well, <laughs> I think you have an idea. Well, I'm gonna tell you anyway. Elaborate wigs were also dressed with lard, L-A-R-D. Hence, they attracted and housed vermin, primarily lice, which is our buddies right up here. And you get bit at night and it required itching. So here's a lice, as I mentioned right here. They lived on the human scalp and fed exclusively on human blood. Ladies unable to reach into their luxurious locks use rods to scratch their heads or risk being eaten alive by their hair dwelling friends to combat the unfortunate odor that would build up over time and control the unwanted parasites, wig wearers would powder or fumigate their wig. The powder was usually made up of finely ground starch and scented with lavender. The term powder room was coined as individuals preferred individual rooms for this messy process. By the way, GW, George Washington, never wore a wig, although his hair was powdered for appearances. The next four presidents wore wigs, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. The late 18th century uh, through the early 19th century, wig trends began dying out due to cost and philosophy. The age of enlightenment brought a new mentality. Educated men were more concerned with the plight of the common man and didn't want to be associated with the nobility. The citizens in revolutionary France ousted the Perut and Brits stopped wearing wigs after William Pitt levied a tax on hair powder in 1795. After that, short natural hair became the new craze in the 19th century and continued on for 200 years. Okay, folks, this is the 13th. Um, this is incredible. Following the discovery of x-rays in 1895, doctors around the world turned their primitive x-ray machines on everything from their hands to patients with cancer and tuberculosis. There was a fellow named Albert C. Geyser, G-E-Y-S-E-R. He was a brash German immigrant who graduated from New York Med School in 1895, same year as it was uh, discovered. And he felt that x-rays were clearly the future of medicine. Researchers also quickly noticed that exposure to x-rays had a remarkable side effect. It made their hair fall out. A fervor swept through beauty circles, which Dr. Geyser noticed. So in 1924, he invents this. It's called the Trico system, which led to the darkest chapter of hair movie quackery in the United States history. On the right, here's an advertisement. It was billed as a method for removing hair with x-rays and of course marketed as harmless and infallible. After two weeks of training, <laughs> a whole two weeks of training, beauticians, none of which were medically qualified, would then go back and they would lease x-ray devices for use in salons across the United States and Canada. This quote cure for unwanted hair turned out to be far more dangerous than anyone could have ever imagined. All, by the way, all of 
uh, geysers, Dr. Geysers, fingers were eventually amputated. Young female clients would receive a four minute dosage. And here we go, this is what they'd do. They'd look into this box here and um, they get four minute dosage of x-rays directly to the face, often once a week for several months. Besides finding the loss of hair was permanent, many ended up severely disfigured and required multiple surgeries to remove cancerous growth and tumors. The trico system victims have been estimated in the thousands. Finally, as a result of this total fiasco and what was occurring, the trico system was abandoned in 1932, right before the Great Depression hit. What a streak. Anyway, 1970, a study found that more than 35% of the radiation-induced cancers in women over a 46-year period could be traced to x-ray hair removal practices. Hence, the effects of these machines were dubbed, quote, the North American Hiroshima Maiden Syndrome. So if you hear that, you got a problem. So this concludes our 13 deadly trends. However, the dangers have not ended. I've got one more slide for you of some things that are going on today. Here's just a few. Tattoo craze. Okay, everybody sees all the tattoos anymore. However, you can still contract hepatitis C, which is serious liver inflammation, if the needles are dirty, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, this is just something you're going to have to really watch. Everybody knows that at this point. You've also heard about this. There are good old tanning salons. This could lead to squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma, in essence, skin cancers, and ocular melanoma, which is eye cancer. The World Health Organization, WHO, WHO, International Agency for Research on Cancer, has identified tanning beds and tanning lamps in the category for highest cancer risk, along with, get this, plutonium and cigarettes. So single use increases risk. Obviously, occasional sessions can triple the risk. And this is what you do not want to see. That's malignant melanoma. And you could go bye-bye pretty quickly from that. Okay, somebody asked last week, are you going to talk anything about high heels? I said, we're going to get there. Well, we're here. Extended high heels can be harmful to your feet and overall health. The negative effects to this, thickened Achilles tendon, shortened calf muscles, ingrown toenails, corns, irritated ligaments and nerves, neuromas, calluses, bunions, hammer toes, and are detrimental to a woman's posture and walking gait. They also may cause hips and spines to come out of alignment as the center of the mass is pushed forward, creating pressure on the forefoot and balls of the feet. Finally, it is blatantly obvious that lifting one uh, up to an, an unnatural height on such a small and tenuous base can easily create imbalance resulting is in, a, in an occasional fall and hopefully that's not gonna to be too severe, but you know what the consequences can potentially be. Finally, we all have heard about this, that's Botox. Uh, minimizing fine lines and wrinkles without the need for invasive surgical procedures can all be injurious, also be injurious to one's health. Uh, there's a show on TV Periodically, it comes out on cable. And once in a while, I used to watch it because I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was called Botched, B-O-T-C-H-D-D. And it pertained to a couple of doctors who are basically correcting previous horror stories uh, that were perpetrated on uh, Vic, uh, uh, you know, patients and that type of thing. And we, I really got to see how bad this stuff could be. Anyway. Uh, Botox can cause pain and bruising at the injection site, intense headaches, muscle weakness, and nausea. Although approved, as Suba mentioned earlier, by the FDA, 
there is still a risk of toxins spreading throughout one's body, resulting in symptoms that mimic those of botulism, including respiratory distress and problems with swallowing. And in more severe cases, there is a risk of death. Okay, and we're coming up to the conclusion. Last slide. Obviously, the human condition will continue on with its never-ending quest for the, quote, beauty of the day. Maybe Miss Piggy here has some sage advice for you. I hope you've enjoyed the ride. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if my sides hurt or my cheeks hurt from laughing at some of this. Some of it's funny, some of it's not so funny, but um, it's definitely, all over the place. <laughs> definitely very interesting. You're uh, very welcome. Jim, we did have one question um, at the one of the beginning slides um, had to do with the Dr. Scott's products, and they're wondering what uh, how was it electrical or what was the source of the electricity? Well, that's, that was the, the, the whole scam. It was never electric. What they did back in the 1900s, this is when Nikola Tesla first came out with uh, alternating current. Of course, he was competing against Edison and Tesla lights up the World's Fair 1893 in Chicago. So th there was confusion over what magnetism was versus electricity. This guy or these, this company just started claiming and Scott in particular that everything was electric. So it was brand new and he pitched it as a cure-all besides, you know, lighting up cities and doing this and doing that. And he got away with it for quite a while. So uh, the, the, this actually is more honest than uh, what Scott was doing here with pitching the electric corset However, and this is the Paul Mall Electric Company, which knew they were dealing with magnets, but look at what they were doing, trying to incent the sale of this. I mean, you get a sample cake of complexion soap, agents earn big profits. All this is is one big peddling program. So it was a scam. <laughs> you know, in no way was it electric. And Scott, <laughs> Scott knew that, but he also knew that nobody knew squat about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and going, we had a couple of comments um, going back to the, uh, the radium and the uh, Curie products. Um, there was several things that came up during World War II about the radium girls and the Elgin Watch Company, uh, where, you know, women were poisoned because they were licking the brushes uh, that they were using uh, to paint the radium on the dials of that as well. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to see if I had, oh, and they talked about too, um, in the 60s and 70s the, at the beauty salons, not only was the hairspray um, fast and furious, but women smoked in the beauty salons. And I'm surprised there, yeah, that there weren't more fires in beauty salons as a result of that as well. That's a great point. I tell you, on this slide, look at this. I didn't point it out, but obviously some of the advertising back in the day was humiliating. It besides not being true at all, but look at this smart girl inference. In essence, if you don't use it, you're not very bright. So look at this, smart yeah. girls. And this is by Helen Curtis, who was a big deal back in the day. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, got a couple more questions have come up. Um, <laughs> how did the beauty standards change from Rubenesque to tight corsets? I can't answer that. Uh, Rubenesque meaning what? Uh, full figured. Two corsets? Uh, no, full figured. As um, I'm thinking of the uh, the Renaissance artist um, Ruben had mostly full figured models, and it went from full sized women um, to the 18 inch waist. So I'm I'm not sure what changed in in the world. Um, well, that's but, a very good point because yeah. uh, I, I I can understand and I've seen 
as many old movies as there, and paintings as a lot of folks. And you're absolutely right. They were full figured back then. Yeah. And they didn't shy away from that in statues or anything, paintings. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what swung the pendulum towards the uh, 18 inch waist. I, I don't know. No. And I think that's all I've got in question. Whoops, hold on. If we do not use natural products for cleaning and hairspray today, could that cause additional problems? And I, I think we've, we've kind of seen that in, in the swing towards all natural products and also, you know, the the use of not using plastics for the containers as well. So yeah. the well, more you know, natural, uh, the better. <laughs> everybody, uh, you prob many of folks probably have heard about grain alcohol. Uh, it's basically almost all pure alcohol, uh, but some people drink it. And it's, it's basically floor cleaner. Yeah. It, that's really what it is. So it, it, it is amazing what uh, mankind, womankind will actually do. Uh, and the knowledge is out there today on most these products, but uh, you still see a few things happening and you just scratch your head. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And another comment about the, uh, the, the Mad Hatter um, being used in, by Lewis in the Alice in Wonderland uh, stories as well, so. Yes. I didn't have time to go into yeah. that with this, obviously. I've spent enough time on what I did. But uh, yeah, there's a whole thing about Alice in Wonderland with Mad Hatters and everything. Very good. Suba, I'm going to throw it back to you at this point. All right. Well, I just got to say, wow. Wow, Jim. Um, I want to thank Jim Lewis and for sharing his valuable time and knowledge. Um, usually, I add something I didn't know. and. I didn't know any of it, Jim. <laughs> Just staring at my screen about how anybody would wear an iron corset. That is just incredible. Radioactive cream, the tapeworm diet. I've heard of tapeworm, but of course, ingesting a tablet so the tapeworm would grow in you so you wouldn't get fat because, the, like you said, the advertisement would say you can eat anything you want. Yeah. And uh, the tapeworm would take care of it. Incredible what people go through, and they're still going through it now, like you showed in one of your slides about tanning boots and Botox and all that. Uh, and, of, of course, the high heels that I see, the really high heels that I see in fashion shows and the uh, people wearing it on TV. Um, but it, the, it still continues today. Yeah, yeah which is incredible uh, what people try to do. Is, um, is that where the phrase to die for comes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. But anyway, folks, uh, thanks for attending from all around the country today. We'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. We invite you to continue to explore, grow, and learn with us. Our Tuesday Explorer programs will continue in April. Uh, this is Jim Lewis's last one for this season. Uh, we've had so much fun with him. Uh, but next Tuesday, uh, the contributions of Native Americans to our world are many, yet we largely ignore what hum humanity has gained from them. This lecture discusses the role played by the first peoples of the Americas in advancing civilization and explores why we choose to ignore it. Uh, Dr. McClellan will be the presenter. He joined the faculty of Northern Virginia Community College in 1975. He's uh, rank a full professor and he's been serving as the Dean of Liberal Arts for NOVA. So hope you join us for next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and our Tuesday Explorers will go through April. Anyway, uh, please visit our website for details on our upcoming programs. And this is where I spell that out. That website is www.aarp.org forward slash virtual VA. V I R T U A L V A. So, Jim, thank you so much. Uh, you always present 
um, great and interesting presentations. And uh, we will always invite you back. Even if you don't want to join us, I will keep on pursuing you <laughs> until, you, <laughs> until you say yes to us. So again, thank you so much for, from all of us. But uh, until next time, we encourage all of you to stay curious uh, and keep exploring. Have a great day wherever you are. Thank you.